Hello and welcome to another installment of Investing with IBD. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and I'm back from vacation. Uh, thank you so much to Arusha Pierce for holding down the fort, and uh, he joins me every week. He is an O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. How are you doing, Arusha? I'm I'm doing well. Hope you're you're nice and refreshed. Uh, you were definitely missed. <laughs> okay, yeah, refreshed certainly. And it was nice that uh, you know come back and we had a Fourth of July holiday. Um, and you know helping us celebrate is Joe Fami. Always great to have Joe with us. Um, I mean, he's one of the the favorites of IBD Live and also uh, one of our favorite podcast guests. So how are you doing, Joe? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to uh, talk markets and look ahead to the second half of the year. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we just finished the first half of the year. I mean, that, that finished on Friday. So uh, one of the things we'll do is we'll kind of take a review of the year uh, for the market action that's been going on so far. We'll also take a look at uh, some lessons from some of the masters that you can have learned for, from the years. One of the big ones and be, is being flexible, adapting to the situations. And then Joe's got some stocks for us. So we'll take a look at those, but let's get right into it. Joe, do you want to start with the NASDAQ or... What do you sure. want to start with? Sure. We'll start with the daily uh, NASDAQ. Okay. And if it's okay, can we start from the beginning of the year just to quickly review? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we started the year with that right off, right away with that January 6th follow through day, uh, which caught a lot of people off guard. And we had that continued strength into January. Caught a lot of people off guard because a lot of people were negative coming into the year, which we'll discuss later. I guess that's sort of a teaser for the rest of the podcast, but make sure people stay tuned. So uh, we had that strong January. And then the statistics show that when January is up greater than 5%, you tend to get a consolidation for a few months, and then you move higher out of that consolidation statistically around late April, early May. And that's exactly what we had. We had that strong January. 13 week cup with handle on the NASDAQ with that shakeout or the low being that Silicon Valley Bank news. Mm -hmm. And then we recovered from that. And what's interesting is after that recovery, that the, the regional bank news was still fresh in everyone's mind. So now I want to analyze and see how is it just a snapback or after that recovery? is it going to be consolidated well? And it actually, I thought it consolidated in that handle very well throughout April. You can really see it in the weekly chart, how not only was it tight price action, it was low volume showing that after that Silicon Valley bank news and surge and recovery, the institutions weren't really selling too much. Right. So you had tight price action, low volume, held the 10 week moving average, and a lot of stocks started setting up. And then right on cue, according to the statistics, after a strong January, consolidation, and we started to move higher uh, around the beginning of May. And that's taken us to the strength so far. Yeah. And you know what? I just got to kind of give you kudos because you, you mentioned that tight action and that being one of the things you were looking for. And when we had you on uh, on the podcast earlier this year, that was the that was the topic. Tight is right. And it, it really kind of uh, was a little bit of foreshadowing because just a, a couple months later, that's exactly what we were looking for. And as, as you noted, I mean, it was just kind of picture perfect. Um, now, you, you also mentioned that the, you know, there, were, there was a strong start to the year. We really kind of had a shift from the Dow Jones Industrial Average starting things. And then it was the NASDAQ and tech. Um, then we really saw this divergence as the as the banking crisis happened after Silicon ba Valley. You know, it just really seemed to be like, oh, it's big cap tech is your safe area. And everything else was, you know, a little hodgepodge of whether it was performing or not. Um, so yeah. what do you think changed to kind of right the ship a little bit? I think um, investors switched over to what's reliable. Because when there's uncertainty in one group, it doesn't mean there's uncertainty in the entire market. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of a safe haven with the, you know, the, the FANG names and the top 10 NASDAQ 100 names because they're amazing companies, reliable earnings, pristine balance sheets, kind of the opposite of a lot of the regional <laughs> banks. So <laughs> money shifted over to what they considered safe and reliable as far as uh, – you know, fundamentally strong companies. 
Mm-hmm. Now, now, Joe, one, one of the, I guess, kind of one of the criticisms of the, the rally early on, or at least as it was merging out of that tight range back in early May, was that, oh, this is such a narrow rally. Uh, it's only the, the magnificent seven, right, of, of those kind of large cap tech stocks. Uh, have you seen it starting to broaden more? Is, is it broadening more along towards what you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it takes time for for moves to develop sometimes. So I think we get impatient and we want everything to participate right away. But yeah. besides the mega caps, you're seeing a lot of software names uh, joining joining the party. You're seeing semiconductors, retail, both restaurants and uh, apparel and clothing and shoes and so forth. Uh, it, housing, the home builders are participating. You have some biotech, some medical products. So I like that it is broadening out. It's just the weighting of those mega caps is so heavy on the index, but I am noticing other stocks participating, uh, which is, which is to me confirming the rally even stronger. Mm -hmm. Now, one problem, I guess, that a lot of investors have is, um, you know, at this point, it, it seems a little bit more obvious, a little bit more like, oh yeah, that rally was for real. But now for those that maybe didn't believe it at the beginning, they're kind of scrambling to catch up and you, you quickly run into the situation where you are extended in the indexes, you're extended in a lot of the stocks. I mean, if we just look at meta as an example, meta platforms, I mean, this thing has just been going up and up and up. You, 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 you know, you can't really buy it now because it's, it's so it's sticking up so far up there. So what should investors be, uh, kind of thinking of right now, if they were on the sidelines or if, if you, let's say you have participated and, you know, things get extended like this, do you have to start hedging or um, what, what's kind of the, the plan of attack? I think it's important to fine tune your time frame and to know your time frame. If you miss some of these moves with either stocks or sector ETFs, you can wait for pullbacks. Eventually they pull back to their 21 day, their 50 day, they visit them every once in a while. So you just have to be patient. If you did participate, uh, in this move, it just depends on your time frame. And there's nothing wrong. I always tell people it shouldn't always be an all or nothing decision. Meaning if you have 100 shares of something, you don't have to sell the entire 100. You can sell 10, 20, 25, even 50, whatever. But you can piece out and take partial profits. But it really depends on your time frame. And if you believe this is going to continue into year end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Joe, so so you mentioned the, the 21 day. And I know you're a big fan of the 21 day. Uh, with, with markets being so strong, or at least the NASDAQ being so strong, especially the larger cap tech stocks, are, are you mainly focusing on the 21 day and being maybe even a little bit more aggressive when some of these key stocks that you're watching, maybe one that you might have missed, but pulling back there and almost treating it as a, the 50 day that most people treated it, you know, usually kind of be as aggressive at the 50 day? Yeah, when the market's very strong, uh, strong stocks, strong ETFs, strong indices tend to hold that 21 EMA. And they do eventually visit the 50-day, but when the market's super strong, that's an area. For example, when NVIDIA had their strong uh, numbers and all the semis surged, you did have a time, if you were patient with, let's say, SMH, the, the one of the main semiconductor ETFs, you did have time to buy that on a pullback to the 21 day IGV. If you missed some of the strong software names, you did have time. So I'm using the 21, um, uh, 21 EMA as an area for, for some strong support because the market to your point is pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things we were noting on IBD live earlier this week is, uh, I mean, geez, the computer software enterprise group. I mean, if you just pull up Arusha G three, five, eight, three, uh, that's our, that's our industry group code. For the Only Justin software. would know the industry <laughs> code. No, oh, I can. What ticker? What ticker? What what exchange is that trade on? Right. Um, but I mean, he, here you have the group, and you know it's it's right there at the 21 day moving average line. A lot of the stocks in this group are at the 21 day moving average line. But there's there's kind of this dichotomy. You have stocks like this that look like this group where it just got above the 200 day line, just got above its 50 day line, and it's it's finally putting in some time above those those lines but then you have the other side you know like the semiconductors like nvidia and you know some of these magnificent seven that are 
they've been up above their 200 day lines now for most of the year. So are you focusing on kind of the ones that are just getting up there or maybe the, the, the stronger ones, the ones that were first out uh, looking for opportunities to get into what, what has truly been leading for most of the year? I'm focused on the, the ones that are already uh, showed the strength. Uh, that have showed the strength and are pulling back. Because I like to kind of focus on the ones that come right out of the gates, especially not only after the fall through day, but after this consolidation, the ones that were moving to to highs in, uh, during that that seasonal strength in May. So those are the ones I'm focusing on. Some of the, I'm just a big fan of the strongest uh, the strongest ones out there. As they say, why take LeBron James out of the game to put in a lesser player? So, and for the Michael Jordan fans, you can substitute him. But my point is, um, because it's that big argument, but the whole point is I'm sticking with the absolute true winners that I can try to stick with. Mm -hmm. And so Joe, what, what about, because I I know you're, you're, you're uh, on Twitter a lot and uh, there's, there's, what, what about the, the opinions of the bears, right? Where, uh, now it's gotten a little quieter, right? Versus last year, right? but uh, or even earlier this year. But what about you know the the Bears' point of view of how everything is really slowing down, and w- with the it think, things are just going to keep getting worse and worse for the next few months, and and you should be very careful about these handful of stocks uh, that that are just holding the market up. I have a theory that I've been talking about this now for a couple months. Um, as far as the bears, I think they're too focused on the macro. And to me, the only thing that matters macro wise is the direction of interest rates. So the market has already started to discount the Fed pausing and likely cutting later this year or next year. So I think that's the only thing I don't want to get, you know, that go down the rabbit hole of all the macro. But my other thing that I've been talking about for the past uh, couple of months is that Strong moves in the markets historically have been fueled by innovations and inventions that have revolutionized our lives, whether it's Mm -hmm. so many examples of railroads and medical products Mm -hmm. and television, airlines, PC, smartphones, Internet, the, the, the list is endless. And my theory as to why the current market is so strong and I'm not paying attention to the macro besides the markets telling me not to pay attention to it is that yeah. AI is that next innovation or invention that is fueling this market and why the market is so strong. So that's why, in my opinion, the market is, uh, I'm sticking with this trend and, and ignoring the bearish uh, argument right now. Mm-hmm. Now, with something like AI, which is you know arguably still in its infancy, um, you know, there's, there's not too many companies that are necessarily making money with this. It's uh, a lot of potential, but not necessarily uh, earnings that are out there and tangible that you can touch. It's it's kind of uh, a little bit more speculative. How do you kind of handle that as a, um, you know, w- w- when there's not as much proof yet of who the, who the leaders are going to be, who the winners are going to be, and they're all kind of vying for that position? If I can give a little pushback to that, I think the guidance from NVIDIA and Microsoft is actually, and we'll get into that later in the show, is actually showing that it's kicking in right now. Mm -hmm. So I do agree with you that it's not, it's still an unknown quantity, but it's happening quickly where even a company like Marvell Technologies, uh, they guided and said their AI chips in the next fiscal year, the revenue from that's going to double. So Mm -hmm. with MRVL, so I do think it's actually, to your point, it's not quite prevalent in the tons of companies, but the main companies that are benefiting the most from it have really increased their guidance uh, and are starting to show that more and more companies are uh, getting involved with AI. And and it is kind of, I mean, like NVIDIA just seems like the the classic picks and shovels play, like everyone's going to be using their chips. So it it doesn't matter who the winner in AI is, NVIDIA is going to be a de facto winner. Yeah. (laughs) And one other thing I want to add is Mark Andreessen wrote a piece, I believe in 2011 called why is software eating the world? And, you know, he's not only a brilliant uh, tech innovator with Mosaic and Netscape, and then his current um, venture capital firm uh, Andreessen Horowitz. So he's brilliant as far as a technology mind. I recommend people read sort of his 10 year later updated piece instead of why software is eating the world. It's titled why AI will save the world. And Mm -hmm. you can find it on Andreessen Horowitz 
uh, website. It's a great think piece that can, you know, a thought piece that can really help you understand it a little bit better of what we can begin to expect um, out of AI. It's, it's, it's something I recommend the listeners uh, check out. Awesome. I mean, that's actually kind of nice because most of the things you hear from AI is why AI is going to destroy humanity, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. So uh, that, that's pretty cool. Hey, we grew up watching The Terminator. I mean, we, we have that kind of ingrained in us, right? Um, it well, just depends on people's mindset, I think. I think some people are worried about exactly Mad Max, Terminator, all the end of days type of movies. But then other people are focusing on detecting cancer two yeah. or three years earlier. Right. Like there, right. a lot of people are focusing on a lot of the benefits and productivity that's going to come from it. What, one last, last question on the market in general, because you did mention um, kind of the the January statistic of a strong January and, and some seasonality numbers that you were giving out. You know, there's the old adage of, you know, sell in May and go away. Is, is that your thought process right now uh, to kind of sit out the summer or what's what's your thinking on the seasonality right now? Uh, shorter term, the seasonality is strong until about the third week of July. Then we traditionally have August and September. A lot of people are away. You get a traditional pullback or at least some sideways. But a lot of the statistics that show strong January, strong first half of the year bode well for you know anywhere from an 8 to 12% gain for the second half of the year. Of course, it's not going to be straight up. Of course, mm -hmm. we're going to have regular consolidations and pullbacks along the way. But depending on your time frame, shorter term for July is strong. And then the fourth quarter tends to be strong as well. Very good. Well, when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of the uh, ideas that have really formed Joe Fami's approach to the markets. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Investors with concentrated equity holdings often have a reluctance to exit their position due to the potential tax burden and other considerations. This creates an unbalanced risk profile in their portfolio. The North Coast Concentrated Stock Triple Play Strategy uses options pricing models to help clients in these situations hedge risk and create premium income. The proprietary approach also makes use of North Coast's market exposure model, which looks at 40 different data sets, and a stock scoring model, which considers more than 20 factors. For more information, visit www.northcoastam.com slash triple play. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and Arusha Pierce, who joins me every week, is with me as well. Uh, he is an O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. And our special guest this week is legend, legendary Joe Fami. He is a managing director at Zor. Uh, Zor Capital and a lot of great stuff that he has on his Twitter. So if you haven't checked that out, you can find him at Jay Fami. Uh, really great stuff that he puts out all the time. So Joe, let's uh, talk a little bit about the the flexibility and the adaptability that you have to have uh, as an investor. And why why do you think this is so important? And what kind of got you started down this path? I think the most important lesson that I, what I love about the markets is that you're learning and relearning lessons. And the, the biggest one is that word adapt. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so many greats, when you talk about all the greats, whether it's Druckenmiller, uh, Tepper, Arusha, I mean, there's so many greats out there. <laughs> but I think of Paul Tudor Jones's line that you either adapt um, uh, evolve, what's the adapt, evolve, compete or die. And because we don't want anyone on listening to this podcast to die, let's focus on the word adapt. It's so important to be flexible. Stanley Druckenmiller says one of his greatest assets in the past 30 years is his ability to change his mind. I can't think of anything more flexible than David Tepper in 08, 09 being short the banks and then literally turning on a dime and aggressively going long in March of 09. So the, the greats always have that flexibility. How it applies to me is I literally put on my blog coming into this year that I was expecting a five to 10% uh, drop in the markets. And I came in very cautious. And if I didn't learn from some of the best and listen to some of the best and be able to stay flexible, uh, once we had that follow through day, we regained the key moving averages and stocks started setting up I said, OK, you can't have any ego in the market. Who cares mm -hmm. if you put something out publicly? You have to be able uh, to adapt to the markets. And I think that lesson that I relearned helped me to quickly adapt to the markets. And one of the things I wanted to ask you guys, working closely with O'Neill, I'm sure he's talked about this or any you know sort of 
tidbits you like that. I'm sure it's a common characteristic, even with yeah. O'Neill, if there's anything that he shared with you on that. Well, I'll tell you that, you know, when I first started working as, as his assistant, this was in September of 99. Um, I had, you know, just been tapped as his assistant. I was really thrilled. I had only been working at the firm for two years and we had had kind of a rough summer, right? And Bill O'Neill had sent to his clients a letter on how bearish he was. And, you know, what well, was this 98 or 99? Just 99. This was 99. So remember there, you know, 98, we had the, we had the long-term capital management and that right. double bottom kind of form in the NASDAQ. Um, and we came out of it in October of 98. Great mm -hmm. move, but you know, things were really getting extended. Right. And okay. he's like, okay. look, we, we're, we're, we're due for a pullback. And this one's, this one's going to be a doozy. So in the summer of 99, he's, he's like, I, I think it's here. And he sent that letter to all the clients, how bearish he was. And then in October, we got another follow through day. So there's Bill piling back in. Right. You know, and I, and I think what, you know, he, Qualcomm might've gone through its climax prior to that. And then it actually ended up forming like a high tight flag and then making another hundred percent move, yeah. uh, you know, later in the year, um, yeah. you know, to close out 99. So, there were all these opportunities in those last few months before the March 2000 top. And even though he had sent that to all those clients, I, I, I remember, you know, talking to him, I was driving him to the airport and he's talking about how bearish he was a couple weeks later, I'm looking at his sheets and he's loading up and I'm like, Bill, like you just sent that letter to clients. And it was almost like, you know, the Ted Lasso line memory of a goldfish. He's like, what? You know, <laughs> I, you know but I mean, it, it's, you know, we had a follow through day and all these, all these stocks are breaking out. So it was just so irrelevant to him that he had, you know, put his neck out there with this, you know, call because he's like, the, the, the data is different now. It's, it's a, it's a different market. And so you have to participate. You have to do something. I love that story because it shows the consistencies with so many of the greats. Mm -hmm. Again, repeating that line, you have to be able to adapt. You can't have an ego uh, you can't be stubborn. You have to listen to, you know, what's that line? Don't focus on what you think the market should be doing. Focus on what it's actually doing. And mm -hmm. it's a similar story where a follow through day comes in, stocks start to act better. You you can either stay, you know, adapt, evolve or, you know, stay stubborn or, or you have to make those adjustments. And so thank you for sharing that because that's, <laughs> that's such a great story. Well, and to your point, Joe, I mean, all of these all of these people that you mentioned, I mean, one of the keys to success in the market is longevity. You know, I mean, just being at it for a long time really can, you know, get that compounding to your favor. And, you know, I just, I just don't see how you survive unless you are willing to adapt because, you know, things change, you know, what, what maybe worked in one market maybe doesn't work so well in another. Um, and another thing about Bill was he was constantly learning constantly trying to find out hey what are some different indicators i can use to just get that much better here he was 50 years experience in the market 50 years plus and he was still doing studies on hey what what could make me better as an investor and uh i think that's also what makes the makes the game exciting you know yeah, so i mean going that... off oh go, go ahead, go, go, go ahead well, just for, yeah just for, very quickly going off the the adapting part now i can understand from from bill's uh kind of methodology where you you have a follow through day. There are some signals there to kind of get you more objective. But Joe, have you uh, run across like with, with Tepper or, you know, Paul Tudor Jones where they had maybe some kind of technical kind of indication or a sentiment type of indication that maybe helped them over, uh, overcome that fundamental bias that was saying that, oh, you should be much more bearish here? Yeah, I think all the greats have like their own. I don't know exactly what everybody does. I think they have their own, you know, especially when you're managing global macro, you have your own, uh, you have your own team, whether it's, you know, Hong Kong and London and, and you at New York, San Francisco, you have offices all over the world. So they have teams working on different parts of the world. But mm -hmm. assuming most people listening are not managing a global macro fund, I just try to keep it simple. So I'm sure they do have a lot of information that might override uh, what their thoughts are, but, and listen to their team, but just for, you know, the average person listening, I think it's best to keep it simple for sure. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to add really quick is that 
recency bias can affect us as well. And one of the lessons I remember, millions of lessons from O'Neill is that, you know, he always says, stay positive. Just when you think it's, yeah. you know, the end of the world, like spring is going to show up and all of a sudden new leaders will, will emerge. And if you go to a weekly S&P chart of 2022, um, another reminder is that bear markets tend to have three legs down. So we had those three legs down. And then when we started to roll over in early November, uh, excuse me, December of 2022, another clue. And I know we talked about this, Arusha, is that there were three weeks tight the week of December 16th, 23rd and 30th. And, you know, Arusha, we were talking about we were still affected from the bear market. We yeah, kind of were sure. ignoring it yeah. because of the recency bias. But that was a sign going back to the tightness conversation of maybe the sellers were drying up and beneath the surface at the end of December, institutions were accumulating prior to this move in January that we saw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think also uh, an element here behind the adaptability is the uh, and, and something to counter the recency bias is the willingness to accept new data. Right. You know, we're, we're constantly getting new data. And I mean, you, you find this in science, too. And I think some of the best scientists were those that were willing to truly look at even their own hypothesis or maybe what they've you know, built their career around. Uh, Stephen Hawking comes to mind, you know, where he was like he disproved his own theory, you know, and was glad to do it because he said, look, I, there's new data that tells me there's something different. And I think especially with. Um, you know, I, I mean, everyone was so focused on macro, Joe, we were talking about this earlier. It was like the most important CPI and, you know, whatever, yes. ever. And uh, everyone was focused on every single thing, um, you know, but you, you do have to kind of roll with that new data. What is the market doing now? What is it doing differently? And to your point, I mean, that those tight weeks, that's if you're if you're not willing to accept new data and see how something is different, you're going to miss some of those best cues. Yeah. And to piggyback on that, same thing happened after COVID, where the new data oh, that yeah. came in was the insane Fed liquidity mm -hmm. that they provided into the system with the bond buying eight rates at zero and just unprecedented liquidity. That's another example of facts change, the news change, the data changes. You have to be able to change your tune and adapt to the markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and really going back to what you said earlier about simplifying it, you know, for those listeners out there, you know, worried about, oh, do I have to really, how much do I have to pay attention to liquidity or how much do I have to pay attention to interest rates and things like that? You know, a lot of times, though, the way I look at it is look, stocks, markets behave a certain way when they're being accumulated and they behave a different way when they're being distributed. And those tight weeks that Joe was highlighting uh, before at the end of 2022, those are subtle signs of accumulations. Fall through days, stocks starting to emerge out of bases and actually holding and slowly crawling up. All of those things, those are kind of the keys uh, and, and behaviors that I'm going to pick up a lot better than the, the liquidity and, and things like that, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do your best to analyze what the, the big institutions are doing, because at the end of the day, they control the markets. Yeah. And sometimes the liquidity issue, I, I feel like, you know, especially like that post COVID, um, the reasons became a little bit more obvious to me after the fact. Right. In the exactly. moment, it was just, yes. this is what the market's doing. And you yeah, we had a fall through day, right? <laughs> yeah, we had a fall through exactly. day. Look for some stocks to buy. Yeah. We just buy and oh, wow, it start, starts to work. Mm -hmm. Market slowly keeps pulling you in. And then eventually, like you're saying, Justin, the the liquidity okay that makes sense why that was all happening mm -hmm. right and you know uh joe i just also wanted to add another example to the the three waves down um if we go back to the nasdaq and in 2003 i mean i think that was another classic example this is kind of the first time that i remember uh bill you know really kind of talking about this in a in a big way but the nasdaq you know in the you know, in, in the moments before that March follow through in 03, um, it did have kind of a, a three waves down. It might be a little bit easier to oh, see it on the, on, on the daily. So you, you, you had that big you had that big overwhelming, you know, move yeah, down. But yeah. if you if you go to the go to the daily uh, on it, Arusha, um, you, you can you can also see. And, and by the way, this was also it was interesting that the accumulation distribution was an A minus. Uh, at the time of the follow through in March, oh, but wow. you know wow. you can see kind of in that 
in that area from December, if you just start in December, there was kind of another three waves down a very short one, you know, um, yeah. you know, r- right in there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this, it's, it's one of those things where you do this long enough, you kind of see these same things repeat over and over. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that Notice the similarities, October low with a surge yeah. and a consolidation that comes out around March, April. I mean, it's, it's as you say, the patterns repeat a lot. So, uh-huh. um, so to, kind of, to kind of wrap this up, uh, do you have kind of some suggestions for, I, I mean, to a large degree, you said this at the beginning, Joe, ego, you know, how you had to put your ego aside, you know, even though you had kind of made this call and, and stuck your neck out. You had to put your ego aside and say, okay, things have changed. How, how do you do that? You know, are, are there, is there like a, is there like a retreat, a man's retreat, you know, type thing where you go into the woods and, you know, how do you get that ego out of, uh, out of play so that you can be more successful? I think to your point about longevity, it just takes, it just, you learn your lessons. If you're stubborn earlier in your career and stick to a call, there's nothing wrong with forming your opinion and letting the market prove you right or wrong. And in the past, I would say no, and I'd argue with the market. But now I just don't argue with the market. And I just really try to stay flexible with my approach. But I think we all learn the hard way. And then you eventually adapt and you just learn to say, OK, I'm going to go with the flow and be willing to be flexible and very open minded when you're analyzing the markets. Yeah. And I'm just going to point out because because our producer did mention, hey, why did you just say a men's retreat? Um, let's be honest here. The egos are a little bit bigger on the men. You know, I, I, this is, I, and I think this is why a lot of people have said women can be better investors because I think, uh, you know, the, the ego on the man is a little bit. Well, uh, to piggyback on that, my line is two things I never argue with is the stock market and women and why, because they're both smarter than, than me and they're both always right. Yeah, there you go. Um, and, and, and Arusha, did you have any kind of uh, things that you want? No, to no, I'm, I'm staying. I, I'm staying right. with you. <laughs> okay, third perfect. rail issue. Here. <laughs> okay. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some stocks that have been setting up, including some of the big ones that have been on our radar for a while and whether they can continue. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Investors with concentrated equity holdings often have a reluctance to exit their position due to the potential tax burden and other considerations. This creates an unbalanced risk profile in their portfolio. The North Coast Concentrated Stock Triple Play Strategy uses options pricing models to help clients in these situations hedge risk and create premium income. The proprietary approach also makes use of North Coast's market exposure model, which looks at 40 different data sets, and a stock scoring model, which considers more than 20 factors. For more information, visit www.northcoastam.com slash triple play. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, back from my couple weeks of vacation. And uh, I'm sorry if that's actually a bad thing because we had two bang up hosts uh, filling in, including Scott St. Clair and Allie Quorum. So definitely take a look at those podcasts if you haven't. Um, we are joined by Arusha Pierce, who joins me every week, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. And this week, we have one of our favorites back on, Joe Fami, Managing Director at Soar Capital. And uh, one of, again, just a, a legendary investor, lots of great wisdom. So he's going to kind of help break down some of the stocks that have been on his radar. And that includes some stocks that are, you know, arguably the the market darlings right now. So, you know, for those of you that are thinking, that maybe you've missed the the biggest leaders. Joe, are there going to be second chances for these? Yeah, I still think there's more upside. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a big reason for the strength in the market and why I believe we are, we are going to head higher is the major invention in AI and innovation in AI because those types of inventions, the key word is they increase productivity. Yeah. And the way AI is going to help businesses interact with uh with customers and just overall i think is uh is still in its infancy stages and i want to focus uh on some of the major ai players okay so we've already kind of mentioned nvidia and uh this is this is certainly a big one um you know from a from a graphics processing unit and you know hey this is something that your video games have to have to have in order to work because of all of the calculations well it turns out doing all of those calculations so quickly helps with AI. So what's uh, what's your take on NVIDIA, Joe? Yeah, it's not just the um, 
all the verticals, data center and gaming and PCs and so forth. Their CUDA software platform is where a lot of this development on AI is. And I have to say, 27 years of doing this, I have never, ever in my life seen a company guide with the insane guidance that they did last quarter. I literally think it was a game changer for the markets. We're going to look back at the end of this year and we're going to say that was the key pivotal repricing of a lot of stocks because they were supposed to do or guide to 7.2 billion. They guided to 11 billion. And I've never seen that. I saw Zoom during the pandemic was one of the greatest growth stories. But as far as numbers this large, uh, I've never seen anything like that. And Jensen Wong, their uh, CEO, I'd like to think he's a smart person. And I know he's one of the most brilliant uh, people out there. He's not going to guide to 11 and then miss mm -hmm. their earnings and then see the stock drop. In other words, I think that was a conservative guidance. So that woke up the markets to uh, the amount of processing power that's needed in data centers uh, for AI compute and so forth. The story is just uh, is very, very strong. You want to combine the strong technicals on the weekly chart where if you look after that big guidance, three weeks tight, showing after a big move, to keep it simple, the institutions weren't uh, selling or distributing shares. Then you had another surge higher, followed by another couple of tight weeks. So mm -hmm. that's nice to see that the institutions are not selling their shares. So you have strong technicals, strong fundamentals, unusual option activity going out over the next 18 months. I still like this uh, as a play over the next six to 12 months. So, right. Joe, w w one, one of, what do you say to people who, who are a little concerned about NVIDIA only having an EPS rating of a 68? And then, of course, you know, you have all this negative earnings and sales. I think you have to think outside the box. I don't think it's mm -hmm. always going to be on paper. I'm actually curious what you guys, what O'Neill would say when the technicals are so strong, but the fundamentals or the estimates uh, aren't quite there. My honest opinion is the analysts just ha have this wrong and have underestimated the power of AI. I'm curious what O'Neill would tell you guys when that situation would come up. Well, I mean, the, I mean, the, a lot of times, kind of the way I, I learned it, it wasn't necessarily what what O'Neill said, but it was just kind of just by observing and being there. Is you're always kind of weighing the pros and cons, and, and so you're looking at the fundamentals, you're looking at the technicals, and I'll, you're also looking at well if you if you bought the stock and and you said you know it has it's close enough i'm going to take a shot at it because of the ai team because it's one of the the great companies out there and technically it's acting well and it's breaking out of this cup and now the market is saying that you're right on it you're actually making money you're not getting stopped out like a lot of the other stocks were uh in the past uh, you might be onto something here and, and you want to listen to the market. So so that's kind of how I learned it. You're always looking at really three kind of areas to help gauge uh, that decision and help inform your decision. Hmm. Well, and there was also the, the idea of cyclical stocks, right? For a long time, chips were uh, the the kind of the standard cycle, right? You have you have the cycles that it would go through. And with cyclical stocks, um, it's it's almost like when the earnings are good, <laughs> that's that's kind of when they uh, need to be sold because it's about to turn, you know. And and when the earnings are bad, that's that's when they kind of need to be bought. But I don't know. The semiconductor industry has changed so much from kind of that cyclical nature to look. You just you know th th this is kind of almost the industrial powerhouse. So um, I guess that was one of the surprising things about Nvidia. This you know when 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 you're saying that game changing happened with the with the guidance. Joe, I mean, NVIDIA was already up 100% for you know, off its bottom. So it was like, you know, and, and, and all of those earnings were looking, you know, looking poor at the time, what they were actually coming out with the actual numbers. So I, I, I know you're trying to push it back on us. I'm going to push it back over to you, Joe. I, so, I was going to say, who's yeah. the host around here? Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what do you, you know, what do you, you know, how do you kind of do that? You know, the, the kind of the, the telltale signal came so late, um, you know, but the technical action was there. So how do you kind of maneuver through that? I mean, I'm just amazed at how many analysts, 30, 35 analysts were all this far off on their numbers. Um, yeah. So sometimes the analysts get it wrong or sometimes the game changer is 
the market just woke up to AI is for real. You saw so many chip companies uh, go up because, again, of more processing power needed um, in data centers and so forth. And I do like to dig into the company. I have talked to people who work there. And I do, you know, when I see these potential true market leaders and, and potential big winners, um, you know, the story is very, very compelling going out uh, where some very sharp people are saying that AI could be bigger than the Internet itself. So, mm -hmm. again, going back to our flexibility discussion, if the technicals break down, if the if it proves me wrong, I'm not going to stubbornly stay long the stock. But I've been in for, been in it for a while. And I think that uh, the growth is still going to be sustained for a while. Mm -hmm. I should also disclose that I do have a position in this myself, and yeah, you know, I've been adding, uh, adding to. Uh, so yeah, and, I, and and as as we're looking at that tight action, I mean, I've been looking at okay, a time time to add a little bit more if I can, uh, because this is this is one where I started smaller, uh, like I was with a lot of things, and then I'm like, wait, you know, this one's really working, and I I, I want to. I want to own more of it and get that position size up. Don't take uh, out LeBron James. Keep him in the game. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, get, how do you how do you give him the ball more? Right. Exactly. Um, so let's uh, shift our attention to Microsoft, which, um, again, one of the one of the things we were talking about on IBD Live this morning was how these companies that are able to reinvent themselves and Microsoft, I think, is a great example of that. It was dead money for 16 years and then cloud computing really kind of lights its fire again and now arguably ai could be another another way microsoft is is lighting a new fire so what's uh what's your take on this one so exactly what you said what's compelling is in a filing last week uh sachin adela their ceo said they expect to do 500 billion with a b annual revenues by 2030 in seven years so I said to myself, well, let me go back and look because I don't know off the top of my head. They've been doing 50 to 52 billion a quarter. So, you know, run rate of a little over 200 to 220, call it billion. So they are expected to more than double revenues in the next seven years. And that's an SEC filing. I know like, you know, they don't have to stick to everything, but that type of guidance is Again, they're not good. Most of the time, I grew up with Jack Welsh at GE guiding conservatively and Bill Gates guiding conservatively, one penny here and all this stuff. That type of guidance is, if, if they're trying to be conservative, is is very aggressive. So I think again, I'm trying to combine the story fundamentally with the strong technicals, amazing unusual option activity, a lot of put writing by the institutions because it's not just retail people who miss out on moves institutions miss out on moves and a way to catch up is to write puts so that if the stock goes down they're willing buyers and if it doesn't go down they can collect that premium so i'm seeing a lot of that type of activity in microsoft which is again why as another the two biggest beneficiaries of ai in my opinion nvidia and microsoft that's why i'm sticking with these names yeah, and, and Microsoft here, it looks like it's been going sideways for a close to a few weeks now. Maybe it sets up a flat base going right into earnings, which would, you know, which would make it uh, even more interesting here. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit about the area in which that's happening. So this has gotten right up there to the highs uh, back in 2021. So all of that bear market angst that happened is now kind of in the rear view mirror for this. So uh, is your expectation for it to tighten up here uh, before it maybe blasts through that level? Or uh, do you think it can just continue, continue higher? And how much higher do you think it can go? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised um, right now, just with the holiday shortened type of weeks, the, the action's pretty slow, but at least I still like to see that tight action. But as you start to run up into earnings. A lot of times Apple will do this. Microsoft will run up five to 10 days ahead of earnings. Ahead of earnings. So you might start to see the move start to run up in, in advance. I believe their earnings are at the end of July. But again, this is a play for my time frame. That's why I always encourage everybody, work on your time frame, fine tune your time frame. If you're a short-term trader, that's fine. If you're longer term, that's fine. But 
for my time frame of six to 12 months, I, I could see it going higher uh, over that time. I don't you know, know exactly when it'll break out, but yeah, it would make sense to form a handle on the weekly and then maybe head higher in the second half of the year. Mm -hmm. And do you ever look at, I guess, the velocity? You know, I mean, NVIDIA has certainly had a little bit higher velocity in terms of its move uh, off of its bottom. Uh, a lot of people get concerned when you get, you know, as large as Microsoft and like Apple just passed the three trillion mark and in, in market cap. When you get that large, uh, I guess the, the the fear is that how much, you know, how much harder is it to make a 50 percent move? One of those big outsized moves when you when you get to be that large. Is that a concern of yours? It it normally would be, but going back to adapting, I I can't believe from roughly 200 billion they're guiding to 500 billion in seven years. So yeah. this is where I have to adapt. And I would normally say traditionally, historically, this thing's going to be dead money for a while. There's no way they can keep growing, but the growth is there. And again, I'm going to manage risk if I'm wrong. I have no problem you know, stopping myself out and, and, and I'll have to listen to what the market's telling me. But uh, I have I mean, I still think there's more upside based on their guidance and based on uh, the type of earnings power that can come come through through all their AI applications. Mm -hmm. so, so, Joe, it seems like you have a, a little bit, you know, quite a bit of conviction in both NVIDIA and Microsoft. Does that give you, you know, a little bit more reason to add maybe a little bit more to these positions versus some of the other more normal positions in your portfolio? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I mean, I'm just trying to stick to the ones that I'm comfortable with that I know are really benefiting. To Justin's point earlier, we haven't really heard it from a lot of companies, but we've heard it from them. So I'm sticking with so far the true leaders. And I know they're not exactly names no one's heard of, but I've talked to a lot of people. More people I talk to are looking to short these stocks because of their moves rather than thinking outside the box of what type of revenue growth and, and earnings growth can and power can come down the road. And to say that these things can go higher in the next six to 12 months, um, I'm just sticking to what the institutions and what the charts are telling me. Mm -hmm. So to kind of get back to our, our Terminator fears, you know, we, we've got these two big AI behemoths. Um, what if we switch to robotics? Um, ISRG, Intuitive Surgical, of course, when they had their big move, the Da Vinci uh, was the, the, the big driving force behind that, using robotics to do these surgeries. Um, what's, what's your take on ISRG now? And are you looking at the robotics creating Terminators uh, to destroy us or for, for more beneficial uses? <laughs> I mean, intuitive surgical was a winner for a long time and they've become the gold standard for the, you know, the phrase is min minimally invasive surgeries, yeah. but the growth is again, it's a way to play AI and robotics where it's, it's growing into orthopedics, growing into urology. So they're not, they're growing into more surgeries. Number mm -hmm. two is they're becoming more, uh, they're becoming more common and, and more hospitals are adapting to them. So they're be, they're, it's becoming more common to use robotics through that Da Vinci Precision 3D. It's really helping with surgeries. And then the third thing is they're expanding internationally to a lot of hospitals, um, you know, overseas and so forth. You had UNH, United Healthcare, on their recent um, conference call, their earnings call, noting that there's more robotic surgeries and noting the growth there. So... Again, great fundamental story, the pickup and earnings, a lot of tight weeks as it's building the right side of its base on the weekly. Maybe, again, this puts in a handle, but this is one. Uh, also, some unusual option activity going out to the end of July and January of 2024. Doesn't mean it's going to work, but that's nice to see as an added bonus. So it just fits the mold of what I'm looking for is to try to combine as many factors as possible to help increase my probabilities of success, fundamentals, technicals, the story, smart money, unusual option activity. It doesn't mean it's going to work, but it just helps increase the probabilities. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, you kind of shared with us that, hey, look, some of these earnings numbers can be uh, you know, forgiven because of the guidance that's coming out. Um, Intuitive Surgical is right there with some pretty mediocre earnings numbers, some red quarters there in terms of growth. Um, 
you know, uh, some single digit sales growth. Uh, anything on guidance from this company that is exciting you? I mean, it's just, it's slow and steady. Not everything is going to be that explosive guidance. I was just trying to come up with something that increasing always, hundreds you know, of billions software, in revenue, <laughs> software chips, this kind of fits medical products. So at least it's a little bit more. Um, I didn't, I mean, I, I easily could have discussed three software names easily. Um, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to come up with something where it's, it's still slow and steady mid teen type of guidance. And, um, I think there's more upside as far as, uh, as a longer term, you know, futuristic play, if that's the right word. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a little bit of a discussion that there's some, uh, you know, some, some viral videos on ISRG systems being used to uh, do surgery on grapes and bananas and all sorts of fruit. Uh, so yeah, I, I saw the video there, there's a video of, of, it's like a remote surgery too, uh -huh. uh, where it's, it's a banana and, he he's taking the peel. Well, he cuts the peel open first with the Da Vinci, and then he sutures it up, and and and, it, and it's remarkable. But uh, Alexis is also saying that there's one out there on a grape. He does surgery on a grape. Uh, so so I haven't seen that one, but I, I that it it's mind boggling when you see some of these technologies, especially when it's remote and they're actually doing that. I, I mean that that in itself can you know. It already is changing the world, but if, if you, it, it could even uh, expedite it and uh, make the open up even more possibilities. Well, and then yeah. there's also, you know, a lot of people talking about the uh, with travel, um, you know, there was that kind of pent up demand uh, after COVID. But is that happening, you know, happening now with some of the intuitive surgical, some of these uh, elective surgeries? I know my aunt, she just uh, had surgery on, you know, her knee. Uh, you know, she's recovering from, and it was one of those things that she kind of put off because, you know, during COVID. So is that something that you think is in Yeah, that's well? another great point. A lot of elective surgeries were yep. postponed yep. longer than we expected. So they're picking up again. That could be uh, uh, a reason for, uh, you know, more upside there. And I mean, kind of joking, I have some friends that are doctors. Once in a while, they go out, they have fun, they drink. And I'm like, I don't want I don't want a doctor doing doing that surgery the next morning. So I would trust the robot, uh, you know, with more precision than uh, than some doctors I know. But again, they're not listening. So ho or hopefully they're not. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. So hopefully they need the rest for the next <laughs> day. For the next. Uh, well, Joe, uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on not only these stocks but also that uh, ability to be flexible and adapt. Uh, hopefully, this is something that our listeners can take to heart and to make themselves better investors. So, thanks a lot for being here, Joe. As always, a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay, and for those of you that uh, have not, you know, joined Joe on on Twitter, he is at Jay Fami. Um, some really great stuff that he puts out there. Very, very humorous as well. Um, and uh, he has some great Twitter spaces that he leads as well. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us this week. Uh, please join us next week. We're going to have Simon Erickson back on the show. We always have a great time talking about some fundamental stocks with him. Uh, he, he has some great stories to share and he does some deep dives on stocks. So uh, looking forward to getting his comments. So hope you tune in for that. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time.